Now let me introduce to you Matthew Dickerson. I love having a go, going over to Google and having a bit of a dig around when I'm going to introduce people. And I love just getting all the little bits and pieces that they forgot to put in their bio. So I'm going to tell you a few little things that I found out about Matthew. He founded Access Technology in 1989. And Access Technology have actually won quite a few awards. I popped into the office recently to check it out to sort of have a, have a look at what it's all about. And up on the wall, it looks like, it looks like a teenage boys basketball trophy room. There are trophies and ribbons and awards and all sorts of things. The, the, there are 18 of them that I counted, 18 awards. The best one, the biggest one, the most exciting one, is the Microsoft Worldwide Partner of the Year Award, collected in Boston, only a couple of years back. That's pretty amazing stuff. Kathy has a best-selling book called SLAM, love acronyms, and you actually be able to use that book to transform your business, so you can find out a bit more about it as he's speaking. You might have actually read his regular column in Computer Reseller News, called At the Coalface, from the Coalface, from. Please join me and welcome Matthew Dickerson. <laughs> Well, it's always good to come to Sydney. I, I flew into Sydney this morning and I couldn't believe the crowds everywhere, there's people absolutely everywhere in Sydney at the moment, the barricades up everywhere, the security everywhere. I didn't know the Intel Channel Conference was such a big deal. It's, it's unbelievable. Apparently, some blokes flew in from the Vatican for this event as well. That's just fantastic. Like, I, I heard of these Intel Channel Conferences, but I didn't just realise how big they were. So, anyway, it's good to be in Sydney and it's good to get out of the country and come down to the, to the big smoke every now and again. So I want to go through, this megabyte told us that, uh, a little bit about what I want to talk about. I've got a book that I've got called Slam, and, and that talks about managed services and the way you can transform your business. So I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about that, but I'm not going to try and read the whole book to you. I'm going to talk about some of our personal experiences. But before I start, I want to get a bit of an idea, just so I, I don't bore some of you with stuff that might be irrelevant. Can I get a bit of a show of hands of people that are, are running what they would call a managed services business now? Good. There's only a few in the audience. So I'll, I'll go through and talk about um, the things that I think you might look at as to why you might start to do that and the things, the tools that you might use to start to progress that way. So the first thing I want to look at is the current IT landscape. Now I've been in the IT industry for, for 19 years now since I started my first business. Obviously I started all about 10 years of age because I'm obviously under 30 of course. Um, but the, the IT landscape has changed quite dramatically. And the first thing that we've seen is really the double whammy of hardware margins have gone down and hardware prices have gone down. Now anyone that's been in the IT industry for more than five minutes can, can just about remember when IT products used to get some sort of margin. We get very little margin on them now. But I can still remember little advertising brochures we had that had 386s for $3,000 and we were getting about 30% margin on those. And that was good old days. That's certainly gone and I don't ever see those days coming back. It's really a consumer driven market. The second thing that we really notice is that the Break up between purchases of hardware and ongoing maintenance has changed quite dramatically. And I did some talking for Microsoft last year and I asked them to do some, some research for me because they've got a few more funds for that sort of thing than I had. So they went and did some research and the figures they came back with were quite astounding. They said the average SMB client, their overall IT expenditure, only about 30% of that is used on their hardware. 70% is used for their ongoing maintenance for their training, for their software, for everything else to do with IT, 70% of their expenditure. So when I look at my business, I think, well, if I'm only going to sell hardware, I'm really only getting the access to 30% of their overall um, IT spend. Next thing's quite, quite interesting. Um, this is made an announcement made by Helen Kerr just before she, she lost her reign as communications minister. And it's, I'm a bit embarrassed about it. I only talk to this about this point when I go overseas because I love the image of Aussies as beer swilling much of men. And when you see this stat, that the average Australian now spends more money on technology than beer, you realise we're a nation of geeks. And that's kind of, well, that suits me. That's, I spend more money on technology than beer. But as a nation, you know, I like the image of the bronze Aussie and you know, the real macho sort of image. So it's a bit embarrassing, but it gives you some sort of an idea of how pervasive IT is in our overall society, that now we spend more money on that than we do on beer. And the last thing, looking at the current landscape, the current snapshot, if you like, is that IT systems are absolutely critical. We used to have clients that we'd sell an IT system to, it may be a little point of sale system. If it broke down or didn't work for a little while, they weren't that concerned about it because they'd pull out an old-fashioned docket book or they'd write something out manually. Now, 
absolutely every IT system we put in, if we ask that owner how important it is, they say that it's absolutely critical. And one that came to mind, I was actually in a taxi this morning and we were going through the M5 tunnel, and I was talking to the taxi driver about the incident in Sydney a couple of weeks ago, and it's amazing. You've got a hole in the ground. What's a tunnel? A tunnel is a hole in the ground. And there was a computer malfunction. Obviously, they were running on non-Intel processors. It was probably a Macintosh or something like that trying to run it. And an IT system stopped working, but people couldn't drive through a hole in the ground. It just gives you an idea of just how pervasive it is. I still don't understand exactly what happened in that process. I think Eric Roosevelt's doing some inquiry or something like that to find out that you know, someone had, uh, had you know, done something incorrect or they'd run a Macintosh instead of an Intel processor-driven um, system. But the idea of just something as simple as that is quite amazing. And that just gives you an idea of, of just how much every part of society is affected by what we're doing. And we might not run the IT system for the tunnel in our businesses, but every client that we've got has that sort of critical analysis of their PC system. So why would you want to change from SLA? If you're running a business now, you're obviously making money, if you've got the time to get away from what you're doing, get through all the traffic with all the, the, the things that happen in Symposia, and get out here to, to try and refine your business. You can't do that if you're not making money. So apart from a couple of people that are already changing your business, why would you even consider changing it? Well, the first thing that, that we found is that staff are hard to retain and staff are hard to attract in the first place. I'm not sure if it's worse in the regional areas or in the city, but everywhere I talk to, people find that. So when you put a good SLA in place, the first thing you find is that you reduce your staff workload. Your staff will actually enjoy working for you, and you become a, an, an employer of choice. We had staff approach us to work for us because we've got SLAs in place. They've heard it's a much easier environment to work in. Second thing is you'll maintain your client base. It's a, it's a valid fear that people have that if I change my business model, I'll lose clients. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, a bit more about that in a moment. But, but that's something that you will do. I guarantee that you'll keep your client base intact if you do it correctly. And the last thing we do, you know, what do we want to do? We're in business. We want to make sure we improve our business profitability. So if you put a good SLA in place, you'll increase our business profitability. Let me talk a little bit more about that fear of losing existing clients. We had that fear, and certainly my staff talked to me about that fear, that if we went and changed our business model, we were a successful business, we've been going about 15 years when we changed our business model over, and the, the staff were scared that we start to lose some clients. And there was one client in particular who I'd really sound out a little bit about it. And he was a guy that I was at school with since about kindergarten, so I'd known him for, for a long time. And finally when it came to the stage of putting the SLA in place, we said, right, let's put this SLA in place for you and, and talk about it a little bit, and he just said, no, nah, this is ridiculous. If this is your superannuation, this is your retirement fund. I can see what you're doing, you want to get regular money off me, and you can go and retire to the Bahamas and just sit back and just collect my money. There's no way I'm doing it. In fact, I tell you, when hell freezes over is the day I'll take up the SLA. So I took that as, yeah, maybe. And I thought, I'm going to work on this guy a little bit harder. About six months later, he had an issue where he had a severely unpatched network and he had some infections on that network. One of our technicians went over in a break fix environment and said, well, here's your problem. And, and I actually thought, well, here's an opportunity. So I talked to the guy and I said, well, I can get that fixed for you and change a certain amount of money. But what I can do is we use a, a tool called Casay as our monitoring tool. I said, we'll load our monitoring tool on for you and I'll do that for you for free. We'll run that for a month and you just see whether you like this whole SLA concept. And he, he liked the idea of free, so I thought, well, we'll go with that. And I was pretty confident that he'd see the advantages of it. So we agreed to that for a month. A week later, I got an email from him. I guess it all just froze over. So you might have a fear of losing existing clients, but I think once they start to see the advantages of SLA for them, and we'll talk about some more of those advantages as we go, you'll really start to see that you're really going to enhance the relationships with your clients rather than start to damage or lose those relationships. So let's talk a little bit about me. It's always a good topic, you know, people like talking about themselves. I'll talk a little bit about how we got to that point where we said we need to make a change. Because again, we're all, we've all got our heads down working hard in business, you don't really want to make a big change in your business because it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. Very briefly, I'll just give you a business snapshot. This gives you an idea of, of our size and, and the organisation. We started back in 1989. Again, as I said, as a 10 year old, I started that in 1989. Um, in Dubbo, a population of 40,000 in Dubbo. So, obviously, a very small city, very small marketplace there. You, you can't afford to get it wrong in a, in a population of that size. Now, we've grown on the stage where we've got 22 employees. We recently started a second site in a, in a town called Orange. Um, and we're going to turn over about $4 million. So it just gives you an idea. Compare that, you know, you guys might be 10 times as large or about the same size or four of it. It gives you an idea when I talk about the numbers, you can compare them and relate them to yourself. Let's go back about eight years. This is where we were about eight years ago. We said, we've got people out there we're storing networks for and we're in that classic break-fix type environment. 
So the average s and client we had probably spent, you know, maybe $30,000 on the unit. Just, again, they were obviously larger for them, just to give us some sort of idea. And the interesting part was, when they spent that $30,000, they thought they got a whole range of things, and, and we understood that they got a new network and we installed it for them. It got interesting after you did the installation of a client. And let me just give you a very simple example to, to illustrate the point. Let's say, for example, two weeks after the install, you've just spent $30,000, you've got this new network installed, two weeks later, one of your staff gets their password, or has caps on, locks on, something really simple, locks their account. They ring up and say, we've, we've done something, I can't log on, what's going on? Technician jumps on remotely, has a quick look, looks like you've locked the account, unticks the box, resets the password, I'll call that customer service for you, sir, you just put that in two weeks ago. Great, love the service, fantastic. Now, let's, let's say, so you, you don't charge for that at all. Let's say, some point <coughs> further in the future, let's say two months down the track, exactly the same thing happens. Now, the expectation has been created by our staff that that might be done for free because they know it's only a five minute fix. So, what do you do then? You say, oh, look, we did it for you for free last time. We'll do it for you for free again. Well, when we look at our technician billable hours, and this is happening to us, we look at our technician billable hours and we say, You've done no work this month. You haven't turned up to work this month. Oh, I've been doing all these little, little fix jobs, you know, all these little funny things that just put your network in. So that's terrible for the technician because he's in trouble. Terrible for our business because we're getting nowhere with it. So then we said, well, maybe we should charge for it. Maybe we have some sort of minimum service fee, some sort of call out fee, or maybe we charge by the minute. So we'll charge $3 a minute to do that job. So we do a $9 job because it took three minutes to do that. And we send out the invoice. It probably cost us $50 to raise an invoice. Not a great business model. As soon as you start saying to the client, well, we're going to charge you for that, well, the client says, well, hold on, I just spent $30,000 two months ago, and you're going to charge me for this? Where's the customer service? So he just thinks that's absolutely unbelievable that you're going to charge him to do some simple little thing because he said, I just spent $30,000. And that's a big amount of money to, for him in his environment. So that's where we were, and I just looked at our business in that model, and I thought we were on a treadmill because we needed to keep putting new networks in to get the money to be able to pay our technicians to keep doing the work for free. And to do that, we needed more technicians, so we needed to put more networks in to be able to pay for the new technicians we added on. And you can see where I'm going. It just goes on forever and ever. And we went, this is crazy. I, my estimation was that in five years' time, I'll be struggling to make money, and in 10 years, I'll be broke. That would be it. So I thought, we've got to do something better. First thing I did was I looked around at making contracts. And looking at maintenance contracts, I did some research, of course, I used my good friend Google and looked around about what was available. And actually, probably wasn't Google, it was probably all for Vista or one of the other search engines at the time. And so I looked around to see what was out there, what was available. Maintenance contracts kept coming up. I said, oh, that sounds about it. Let's have a look at maintenance contracts. So the typical maintenance contract had some sort of monthly fee. Let's call it in today's environment. $1,800 we might charge our client for a set number of hours, maybe 10 hours. So we're getting a good rate for our time and we're getting a guarantee every month. And if we do a bit more work than that for the client, we're nice. We'll give them a bit of a discount. We'll, we'll knock them back to say $150 an hour just to let it flow through and, and make them feel like they're getting a bit of a benefit from it. So that, that's the, the sort of premise that we set up. And then when we do the work, we record the time. So we're still recording the time and we're still going through that process of recording that time. And then at the end of that, say at the end of each month, we work out the billing from all that. So we, we go through and we have a set number of hours sold, and I'm sure you're familiar with the, the general maintenance contract scenario. And a bit like your mobile phone with a set plan, you don't have any allowance for going under or over each month. It's like, there's your amount, and, and we set that amount. If you go over, you pay for it. If you go under, good luck. So that was the, the general sort of thing. I did a bit of research around that and, and tried to get some feedback about what people thought about that. And the first thing that we found in that research was if you go under the number of hours, the client's annoyed because they feel like they've been ripped off. Well, if I paid for my 10 hours last month, you only did seven hours worth of work. Well, sorry, that's the maintenance contract. Well, you ripped me off three hours. So it didn't seem right. But if you go over the number of hours, they went, I've got to pay you extra. Well, I pay my set $800 a month. Why am I paying extra? So unless you can get it spot on the money, how many hours are you going to spend each month? And I, I couldn't get that. That's too much for me to handle to say exactly how many hours we're going to do each month, that didn't really work for the client. The second thing is that 
was always involving client downtime. A bit like the tunnel, you're not trying to prevent a problem from happening. You're just saying, well, when you have a problem, you've got a certain number of hours set aside and we'll fix up the problem. It doesn't really help much when they've got a process payroll or they've got some urgent sales or urgent tenders to get out. If they say, oh, that's great, that's covered under our hours, but we can't do the work we're trying to do. The thing that I find really amusing is that you're rewarded for having a bad network. So when you come in and say, I'm going to do a fantastic job setting up your network, I'm going to put great DR plans in place, I'm going to do a network job that's so good, I'll never have to come back and then I'll make no more money. Well, that's no good. I'm going to do a really bad job in the network, so I have to keep going back and I can make some money. That doesn't kind of make sense in, in an overall sort of way of rewarding you for doing a good job. So you get rewarded when you do a bad job. And it's really reactive. It's really focusing on fixing up someone's network. In fact, I, I remember doing a talk in, in uh, actually in Sydney, uh, sort of in Brisbane, I was in Sydney, and one of the guys I talked to at the beginning, he had a badge on it that said, excuse me, anyone in the audience room, you had reactive solutions. And I started laughing, I thought it was a bit of a joke, but he said, no, that's our business name. I said, what a terrible message to send to your customers. We're reactive. Yep, we'll do nothing. And then when something happens, we'll react to it. Well, that's not kind of the message that people want now. It just didn't seem like the right message to send out to, to your clients. And ultimately, it just involved frustrations. It didn't solve any problems. I had one client that we got onto an SLA recently, and the story they told me, they were with another IT provider on a maintenance contract, and the thing that pushed them over the edge to leave that particular IT provider was they had a guy out, they were on a maintenance contract, they had a guy out who was fixing something, and about a week after that, their whole network stopped. And when they rang up and said, can you come and fix it? They came around and they said, oh, I know where it stopped. The hard drive pool. They said, well, you were here a week ago, didn't you notice it? Oh, oh, I didn't really take much notice of it. Well, what am I paying you for to come out and do things? I want someone who looked at that sort of thing. So they kind of sat that guy on the spot and ran asked and said, we heard you've got something where it's proactive when you look at that sort of thing. It's a simple thing, but that can be enough to push people over the edge. And you've all seen someone on the end of the phone that just gets so frustrated with your IT. You can't see them on the other end of the phone, but you know they've got a face that looks a bit like that, where they're just so frustrated, they want to jump down the phone, or they want to throw their IT system out the window, which might be good because you might sell them another one, but they'd probably go somewhere else. So you don't want clients who look like that. So what do you do about that? What, what do we do about that? We said, we've got to be able to do something better. We've got to try and work out what to do. So the thing to do then is go and ask our clients. So I committed to an arduous regime of going to the pub every night of the week, going out lunches every day of the week, and meeting with our clients to go through and find out what they wanted. I put about 10 kilos on the process, but I really got down and found out what they wanted in the process and, and surveyed them all and took all the information. One thing that I heard loud and clear over and over, anyone that experienced maintenance contracts in their format that I described a moment ago wasn't happy. They were not delivering what they expected an IT system to be. There were four key features that every client went through and wanted. Some of them wanted a lot more than that, but there were four key things that came through loud and clear from all my clients. Fixed costs. They felt like every time they saw me, I had my hand in their pocket. You can probably get in trouble for that sort of thing, but they felt like I was always taking their money. They felt like every time they talked to the IT person, oh, he's taking some more money from me. But they wanted fixed costs. They wanted to know how much it was going to cost for their IT support. They wanted guaranteed response time. They wanted to know when they rang and said, I've got a problem, sure, someone will be there or someone will be looking at that problem in a certain amount of time. They also wanted someone that knew their network. They were so frustrated with people turning up saying, gee, I don't know why you've done this in the network. And the client would say, well, that was one of the blokes from your organisation who did that two weeks ago. Oh, oh gee, we should have done it that way. I'm going to do it this way. They, they just felt like IT technicians didn't have an understanding of their network. They might have great technical skills, but they hadn't applied them to their network. And last, it sounds a bit radical, but they wanted to talk to people. They wanted to talk to technicians, they wanted to talk to sales guys, they wanted some regular contact to just find out what was going on in the overall IT environment. They wanted to talk to people about their IT, to try and get someone to help understand or get them to understand what happened. They wanted a mid megabyte coming along every month just to talk to them in simple terms about what was going on in IT. So, we kind of looked at all that information. And I'm sure someone can tell me, someone very clever in the audience can tell me what that says on, on, on the screen there. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> great one to just take from there. Opportunity, most people see opportunity is nowhere. And that's what we felt like. We looked at all the information, all the research that came back, and I had a meeting with all my staff, and I said, right guys, this is what the, the, the clients out there want. And they just said, well, we can't deliver all that. How can you get fixed costs in IT? We don't know how long we're going to spend on it. 
So we sat around for a while, scratched our heads, and went, well, maybe we just can't deliver it. Maybe it's too hard. Maybe the reason that no one else has really done this is because it's all too hard. And this is going back eight years, remember, where my main services wasn't really a firm that was known. Then I thought about it a bit more, and I said, well, rather than opportunity is nowhere, maybe the opportunity is now here. And that, I knew everyone knew the answer to that one. Um, so that's why you didn't put your hand up and answer. But the opportunity is now here. And I thought, well, if this is what our clients want, and no one else out there is delivering it, then maybe, maybe the time is here to build a better mousetrap. Maybe the time is now to build a better any services or a better maintenance contract. So we set about doing that. And I thought it would be an easy task. And, and I gave them a couple of my staff and said, oh, yeah, go and do this and come back to me in a month's time with the finished product. And a month later, they're going, oh, I haven't got anything done. This is, this is hard. And after I went to a couple of staff doing that, I said, oh, you guys are so good. Next weekend, I'll knock it over. And about four and a half years later, I finally actually rolled out my system. It was a hard thing to do. There were five key items that I'd see that you have to do if you're, if you're designing many services contract or many services of solution, there are five key items that I found that build on those four key items that, that customers wanted. The first thing was fixed price policy. You don't want to talk hours anymore. Hours are gone. I think we're much cleverer than the old fashioned days of, well, I think it'll take me three or four hours and I'm going to change this much per hour and I'll tell you how much it is at the end of that. And to give you a really simple example, one of the things that we used to find the most frustrating was a simple virus on a single PC. We've still got a retail store in Dubbo. So people used to drop in their PC to us and say, oh, I've got a virus on here. And we'd say, okay, well, we'll clean it off for you. And they'd come back to pick it up and we'd say, oh, it's about $150. And the person would have a heart attack. What? I can see any virus package on the shelf over there for $60. And you're going to charge me $150. Then the technician would go through and explain what was involved, because there's a bit involved in removing a virus and then getting it all fixed up and make sure it's all okay. And then he wouldn't be happy with that. So then the manager would come in and he'd have a bit of a chat with the client. Meanwhile, you spend another half an hour arguing or discussing with the client, and then you say, ah, oh, it's not worth it. For the sake of customer relations, I'll knock it down to $100 for the service. He walked out, he's probably not overly happy. You've probably spent three hours, including your management time, to get to a result where you've got $100, and no one's happy. We change that model, and now if someone walks in with a PC and says, I want that virus clean, we say, that'll be $150 up front. And they say, well, that's too dear for me, I'm going to Billy Bob's up the road, they pick up their PC and walk out. Or they say, I agree with that, and there's no argument afterwards. Sometimes our technician takes two and a half hours to fix it. Sometimes he takes half an hour to fix it. But it's a fixed price for that. Which comes to the next point is, you have to have your work based on outcome. OBSW, it's got to be an acronym in IT. So OBSW we talk about in our, in our organisation all the time. We will only charge you as a client if we get an outcome. Why should you have to pay because our guy didn't know what he was doing and didn't actually fix the problem for you? We give you an outcome, you pay what we quoted you in the first place because we've got a fixed price policy. We don't waste any time anymore having discussions with the client after we've done the job about how much it should be. The only discussion we have is before the job, it'll be this much, I'm not happy, see you later, or I'm happy, let's do the work. It makes it a much simpler, much cleaner environment. You need easy to calculate price. You don't want to say to a client, I'll come back in a week's time with that SLA quote because the client finds that it's, it's down there, they've got the point of pain, they need to have that point of pain sold right now. Our secretary, every technician, every salesperson in our organisation can quote a person for an SLA in five minutes maximum. They ask them eight variables and then they produce a quote for them. It's as simple as that. And that's how it needs to be. It needs to be very simple. This is a scary one. When I, when I came up with this concept and talked to my staff about this, you can see that they were quivering. Money back guarantee. Now, now just think about this for a second. Um, big lead, good guy, someone like that. You walk in there and you buy a toaster. And it's got a guarantee, it's got a 12-month guarantee on it. You go home, you use it for a month, it stops working. You walk back in and say, it's not working. And the guy says, oh well, sorry about that. Well, can you fix it? Can we another one? No, no, just sorry, we did our best. You wouldn't really be that happy with that outcome. So if we're going to guarantee a response time, and if we don't hit that response time, we say, you know, sorry, we get it go, but we didn't quite make the grade. The client's not going to be happy. If we say, and what we say is we'll give you 5% of your monthly feedback, if we miss a response time, there's a few variables that we have, but if we miss them, we give you 5% of your money back. And we have to do that sometimes. But the, the absolute loyalty you gain out of a client, realising that your solid, your commitment to their organisation and your SLA is unbelievable. You can, you can guarantee they're going to sign up again next year, and they're going to tell terrible people about how wonderful it was. 
I don't like getting money back. Don't bring it on. I spent time you know, jumping around and getting excited about getting money back. But we put it in place to make sure that our staff are focused on delivering what we said we'd deliver. You make a promise, you get penalised if you don't. So the staff are scared about that one, but it's been incredibly powerful. And the last thing they really want, or, or we see that's really important, is that you've got to be proactive in your consultancy and your maintenance. It's not just about doing your maintenance work, that's, that's extremely important, but also talking to the client. As I said, they wanted to talk to sales guys as well. So doing something proactive. And you really want to see it yourself. It's a bit like a doctor who sees someone when their system is well. So you can imagine how silly it would sound, I'm feeling great today, I'm going to the doctor. People would think you're crazy. But that's what you want to do with your IT system. And in fact, in America now, and I've heard of some of Australia, I haven't been able to find one, but in America there's a, a group of doctors called MDVIP. They charge you $1,500 a year to just be their doctor. But what you get for that are four guaranteed appointments a year where they create and track a wellness plan for you. So they try and get you when you're healthy and keep you healthy. If you're not doing things that are keeping you healthy, they're on top of you. What a great idea. I think it's fantastic. So what we're trying to do is exactly the same thing in IT. And when I, when I wrote the book that, that Ms. Megabyte mentioned before, one of the things I had to do was come up with a, a succinct definition of what I saw managed services are. And that's the definition I came up with. Proactive day-to-day -day management of IT infrastructure to maintain optimal performance for a fixed fee. The three crucial things there. Proactive, optimal performance, and a fixed fee. They're the three things that clients really want to see. If you can design something that has those three key elements in there, then they're going to be happy with that. You can steal that definition if you like. It's, it's something that I think is absolutely vital in working out what you do with a managed service. So, what are the benefits of the client? I mean, I'm sure your mind's kicking over with all these benefits already, but I'll outline some of them. Fixed prices. The first thing you're doing that quote is we outline a quote for a client that outlines platinum, gold, silver, and bronze. In doing that, the client actually chooses what their response time is. The client chooses how much they're paying. So when they choose a gold level, which has a two hour response time in our example, then the client says, well, you came here in an hour and 50 minutes. I agreed with that beforehand. That's fair. They don't jump up and down because you didn't turn up in an hour because they know that's the platinum response time. So the client's actually choosing the level of service along with choosing how much they pay. After they sign that initial contract, you don't have conversations with them anymore about the dollars. They've agreed with that. They've put that in the back of their mind. They just want to make sure you deliver on what you said you deliver on. The scheduled downtime, this is incredibly powerful. Very simple example. I gave the hard drive example before, but a very simple example that we've seen recently is the, the migration with Exchange Service Pack going from 16 gigabytes to 75 gigabytes. The power in talking to a client and saying, your exchange database is at 15 gigs, it's going to hit the 16 gigabytes soon, which means email down. In today's environment, email down is, a, is an absolute disaster. So we'll schedule some time that's convenient to you to upgrade your service pack. When would be a, a time that's convenient to you? The client thinks that it's absolutely unbelievable. They just see the incredible. The client thinks that it's absolutely unbelievable. They just see the incredible power in knowing when their IT system is going to be down from scheduled maintenance. Better uptime is better profit. I love it when my clients tell me they're making money because I know I'm going to get a little bit of that. In fact, every now and again, you'll get a client who'll ring up begrudgingly and say, oh, "I've been put in for a few big jobs lately. I've got this really big job." So I'm going to have to give you some of that money now because I really need to upgrade my system. I want my clients to be incredibly successful. If I can get their uptime better, I think they're going to be more productive, make more money, and then keep giving some of it to me. I don't want my clients going broke. It's not a good business model if all my clients go broke. In fact, our retention rate on our SLAs is almost 100%. Why it's not 100% is because we've had a client go broke. And so I can't claim 100% because they didn't renew their SLA. So consultancy business as well, they actually find these really powerful. The first thing in the consultancy visit is you get to keep the client informed. They want to know what's going on in the overall IT world. They also want to know that things are happening in their network. They want a bit of an understanding about how things are going, and if they're not happy with something, they want to talk about it. And you'd much rather talk about it with that client rather than never see them and then they just don't renew their SLA. So you get a chance to review the relationship and actually keep the client informed about IT. Next thing you do, is you assess the needs. Now, I love that term. That actually means sell them stuff. The, the best example I've ever had is I use a, a, a nice little Toshiba tablet and I turn up to my consultancy business with my tablet, spin it around and start writing. And I sat down with two partners in an accounting firm one day. And I did the same thing I normally do. I spun them around. And they both kind of had their jaws on the ground. I said, I showed them explained to them. Well, why haven't we got one of those? Well, we didn't have one of those. Well, well let's get two. I said, okay, that's great. I sold 
home by the end, docking station, all the rest of it. About 10,000 dollars worth of gear before we even started the consulting business. Now, I don't say you go in there as a hard sell mode, but just by the fact that you're talking about technology, you will sell them more gear because they're aware of more things that are out there. What's most advertising? Most advertising is about awareness. Getting in there in front of their face, talking about technology, I guarantee you'll sell them something every time you go there. It might only be a small thing, but you'll sell them something every time you go there. They feel great because you're keeping them up to date. You feel good because you're selling them from here. But the best part is you build the price of those consulting visits into your overall SLA. So they're paying you to come in and sell them here. It doesn't get much better than that. What are the benefits to you? It's all well and good to have benefits to the client. Well, I've just talked to, to about one of the benefits to you. What are some other benefits to you? One of the things that our staff used to tell me was they'd always get a hard time from our clients and every time our tech would go on site, it'd be a price situation. Oh, thank goodness you're here. Why weren't you here 10 minutes ago? Our whole system's down. They'd be under stress and feeling it very much from their clients straight away. Now we get our staff coming back and saying, you know, it was great. I turned up for the maintenance check. Oh, they love seeing me. There's one lady in particular who has a cake and a cup of tea out for our tech every month because she wants to do a chat to them about the system and how it's all going. And then he goes off and does his maintenance check. So people love seeing the access line now. And on the odd occasion, you still get a problem, because it still happens, where you've got to react in a reactive way and fix the problem. They're not getting the grief because they've already got a relationship with some of your technicians. So they, they feel much better about it. The next thing that you do is you take away some of the admin work. Now put your hand up if you've got technicians that love to do invoices. I mean, I just cannot get my technicians to really get excited about doing invoices. Technicians, by their nature, want to get in and fix stuff. They don't want to do that boring old thing of invoicing. That's, that's monkey work. Anyone can do that. I want to get out there and fix stuff. So you take away things that they're not good at. Take away the invoicing. Now, all our SLA work is done by one of our admin staff. All the invoicing is done by admin staff. Typically, our platinum clients are the end where everything's covered. The technicians just go out and do the work. They just love it. They don't have to worry about all this painful admin. Plus, they're a technician more of the time. So when you've got a shortage of technicians, that's a great way to solve it. Get them being technicians more often. You'll have to look at me positively, gain more revenue. Simple old marketing 101. The best people to market to are your existing clients. If you're seeing them on a regular basis and they've got a great relationship with you, you will sell them more gear. You'll capture additional revenue that you didn't even know was there. You'll get ahead of your competitors in the marketplace because they haven't got the same offering. You've got something unique, except if you're already in the same suburb and you all go back and implement it tomorrow. It's not a bit of a problem. I'm sure you're sitting big enough to handle that around here. Um, so you'll make more money out of the whole process because you've got something that's a better business model than what you've got now. And the age old saying, if you keep doing what you've always done, you keep getting what you've always got. Well, I think Rita Mae Brown said that the definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing and expect a different result. And it reminds me of a story. There's a, there's a group of uh, friends of mine who are, who are um, you might call them rednecks, they're pretty, pretty laid back sort of characters. And Glenn McGraw, we'll see you're, you're all aware of Glenn McGraw, he owns a property out past Dubbo. These guys go out there once a year and go pig shooting. So it's a, you know, it's a bit sort of not my cup of tea, but these guys go out there pig shooting. Last year I rode a push bike across the Simpson Desert and in our training we went out there. To give you an idea of what the place looked like, these guys go pig shooting on, there's a, a snapshot of the scene. That's actually the runway there that's on the lane down of this property. But these guys go out there once a year, so they're kind of boys weekend, four guys that jump on a plane, they land out on the Lemongrass property, they go pig shooting for the weekend, jump back to the plane, come back to the boat. Sometimes they kind of have a bit of success and actually shoot a pig and they want to bring back a head of the trophy. And the most recent one they did, which was just last year, about, the, about nine months ago, they were coming back, and when they took the plane land to pick them up, these guys had four pig tents, and they're ready to load them on the plane, and the pilot says, there's no way we're going to get off the ground with these four pig tents. You know, there's just too much weight. It's only a little single-engine plane. You're a kid. And I said, oh, mate, you know, we can do this. And they had a bit of an argument. Finally, one of the guys said, you know, the pilot last year, he never put the pig tent on his plane. And I was right, you know, we're like, well, he's making it done. Right, you know, load them up, let's go. So you can imagine, they're going down that runway, which just looks absolutely terrible. They bounce along, try to get off the ground, didn't get anywhere, ended up ploughing into the runway into a ditch, knocked all the guys out. Didn't it? Because the battery just knocked them out. And as they're slowly waking up, one guy comes coming to him, he's looking around, he had no idea where he was. He hit hard enough to have it, he lost his memory a bit. He's looking around and says, Where are we? And the other guy goes, Actually, I think we're in the same place we crashed last year. <laughs> So you keep doing what you've always done, you're probably going to keep getting the same result. In your business life, if you're happy with your business model and you don't see that need to progress, keep doing what you've always done, but don't expect 
things to change in terms of the reactive solution you get. The most common story I hear from talks like this that I do is that not everyone turns up to the talk. And you talk to the organisers and they'll say, oh yeah, we've got a few of the guys ringing up. And they'll say an emergency came up, but I couldn't quite make it to the talk. Well, those guys were the guys that most needed to be at the talk, so they didn't have to keep going out and putting up spot fires and needed something more proactive to come along and, and realise that. So, it's all on a good talk theory. It's all on a good to say, these are the things you should do. You, you hear business coaches all the time rather on about all these wonderful things you should do. What did that do for us? Let's talk about some real world results. So I'll, I'll give you some real numbers here out of our business. Don't talk to them about too many people, but here's some real numbers. We launched in 2005. Uh, again, I started the process of, of research and working out what we needed to do in 2000. So we launched them in 2005. I, I talked about the size of the business before, about $4 million turnover. We've got now over 100 sites under SLA. People love it. They thought it was a great concept. We've got 1,100 computers or more than that actually under management with our SLA. Now, that's about right for Dubbo. 11 PCs, that's probably about our average customer. We're not a big city. So, again, scaled up to what your, your client base looks like. The thing that blew me away, I got this wrong, I read the market wrong. 75% of our clients are on platinum and gold. What I got wrong was how much of a need there was for this sort of work. I kind of worked out that we probably have 40% down at the bronze level because it was cheaper and maybe 20% at silver and smaller numbers as we went up through the scale. But the platinum and gold are the most popular because people want higher levels of service. We've got at the moment almost $1 million of our $4 million in guaranteed contracted revenue. That's not those clients who honestly way spend that money. They spend more than that because they upgrade their networks, they spend more money with it. That's signed off contracts, almost $1 million in signed off contracts. So I can, I can sleep well at night knowing that every year I've got a million dollars coming in out of signed contracts. And the thing that's nicer about that, my accountant is really excited about this one, we offer small discounts to pay 12 months in advance. 65% of our SI income is paid into our bank account before the SI starts for the entire year. We, have, we say to our clients, it's got to be at least one month in advance, but we'll give you a discount to pay 12 months. That's pretty nice. That's my wages bill in my bank account before I start the financial year. That's great. What a great, comfortable position to be in. And I mentioned before, we haven't quite got the 150 million rate. Um, things outside our control a little bit. I hope we didn't cause any of our clients to go broke. But effectively, I'd call it a 970 million rate. People just keep signing up each year. We put our prices up. We put our prices up by 8% two years ago. We put our prices up by 5% this year. We keep putting them up by higher than CPI. People don't talk about it. They just go, we need it, we've got to sign up again. Let's do it. I used to feel like my business was a gamble. In fact, I've told this story a thousand times. I used to come into work every Monday morning, and what I'd do is I'd hand out pillows to all of my staff. And I'd say, oh yeah, drop to our knees, let's start praying. I hope someone's network breaks down this week so we can make some money. I don't do that anymore. We've got a guaranteed revenue stream. So my business isn't a gamble anymore. My business has got solid footing, I've got a spread of different clients that I can say, I know even if one goes broke, they're not going to kill me. I've got that guaranteed revenue coming in. They're not going to jump ship to someone else because you've done something wrong because they've paid you the money already. They're going to ring and say, I'm not happy about something. I've got a chance to fix it. So business certainly is much nicer in that type of environment. Let's have a quick look at some client quotes. And there's a mixture of client quotes and, and reasons for people to quote different things. This firm was an accounting firm and for them, the simple driver was productivity. They talked to me and said, are we going to bring greater productivity? I said, yes, you are. He said, well, simple then. I'm paying you some money so my staff can do more work. Done. Let's sign up. He's been happy. He was one of our first customers. Signed up straight away. This is a client in Sydney. That don't steal me. This is a client in Sydney. We're 400 kilometres away. Why did we get that work? Because no one where he was was offering this type of environment. But we're picking up work from, we're picking up some of your clients because you aren't offering this type of business. He thinks that we are like some of his own staff. We're 400 kilometres away. How can that be? Because we're offering an SLA that's proactive. We're doing things in a proactive way. This one always amuses me. A group of doctors over in parks. What they got really annoyed with with their last IT provider was they used to get these nasty unexpected bills. They weren't sure if they could make their BMW payments this month or not. So they liked the idea that they were going to get a fixed cost coming each month. And the last one was the one that I mentioned before. When hell freezes over, I'll sign up to an SLA. He signed up, and he's actually renewed since that first sign up. So people out there want this sort of thing. 
So what are the summary messages? What are the things you should take away from this talk? What are the crucial things? Well, the first thing is, do the clients have higher expectations? Even, even higher, they keep amazing me at how much higher they are. We did a recent, well, I suppose you'd call it an experiment. We said to a client, there's a new technology out called Vipro. We'd like to put Vipro into your environment because we can switch off your machines in the middle of the night, we can switch them on to patch them. There's technology within, I mentioned Kaseya before, within Kaseya to talk Vipro. It's a great technology, but it's going to cost you more per machine. It's going to save some money on electricity. They're very green, but it's going to make them more efficient. And we weren't sure how it would go. The client said, oh, it's only that much extra per machine. Let's put it in. It's amazing how much people want the technology that's out there. So it continually amazes me just how much people want. I think the market at the moment is expecting something better. If you're not going to deliver it, I think someone else out there is going to. Someone's going to talk to your clients. Your clients are going to hear about the, the technologies and the methodologies that are out there. Someone else is going to come along and deliver those technologies to your clients. So the market's expecting it. I think you've got to deliver it. It guarantees your future profitability. As I said, I, I wouldn't be talking to you now if we'd done what we kept doing back in 2000. So I reckon by that now we're getting close to being broke because we just couldn't keep going on that same old treadmill that we're on at the time. You want to guarantee your future profitability? Have clients sign up for contracts to keep that regular revenue coming in. Um, this, was, this is quite interesting. I, I read some University of Sydney research. It was someone, some government-funded research that was done. And they, they tried to work out the best way to finish a project. And what the research showed after six months of research and a couple hundred thousand dollars of government money was that the best way to finish a project, in fact, 100% of projects that were finished were started. Pretty, pretty inclusive sort of research, I thought. So, if you want to get started, then, oh, sorry, if you want to finish, then you've got to get started. Now, one of the things I think Intel is doing, people talk about there's no such thing as a free lunch, but I think today Intel are giving you a free lunch. What they've got is they've actually bought a copy of my book for everyone that comes along and attends this session, which I think is incredibly generous of Intel. So, you didn't pay anything to come here today. You're coming along, you're hearing some fantastic talks during the, the day and evening, having some free drinks. But if you want to start taking some action, you walk out here with a book, sure, you can, you can remember some things that I talk about for, for 45 minutes, but you walk out here with a book, you can go back and you can start making some changes in your business tomorrow, take some of that information from the book and really make some changes. So I think that's pretty incredible from Intel to be able to support you in that way. And the last thing is, if you really make those changes, the 70% expenditure on maintenance that I talked about at the very beginning, well, gee, if someone said to me, would you like to have 100% of someone's IT budget or 30%, you know, I don't think it takes... Einstein to work out that probably the 100% is a better way to go. So if you were to be able to get both pieces of the pie, or in fact just really concentrate on getting as much of that IT budget as you can, then having some sort of service arrangement, some sort of media service arrangement, is going to allow you to really tap into that. What I'd like to do is just to invite Camille from Intel just on stage at the moment to talk a little bit more about what, what Intel is doing in terms of media services in that space and doing things like supporting you in, in terms of giving away slams, and then we'll take some questions from you. Can you hear me? Excellent. Guys, I just wanted to share just a few minutes of what we're doing at MSP and especially Channel. Now, the VPRO platform, hopefully, uh, you know, um, as you've discussed, was launched in 2006. As, as a basic platform for all these services that uh, Matthew's been talking about, we've been driving the VPRO message since then and trying to get people to understand what MSP or managed service is about. It's a little bit difficult to explain, I guess, from two years ago because there wasn't too many case studies of people out there doing what we're talking about now. And I'm really glad that we've had Demanti here to kind of talk and lay out what, what this is all about. So later on, we'll be talking a little bit more about VPRO and what we're offering with the, uh, the new McCary Creek platform and so forth. But if you're looking at some kind of development, and, and as we said, everything starts today. Information is provided to you. Come and see me afterwards. We're looking at growing our MSP and services offering by Intel. So look for me. I'm happy to try and help with you and work with you into developing channels to manage services thinking outside the box. So I want to share, share with you, look for me, and I want to thank you, and I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Phil. It's pretty exciting. Intel is a hardware company, but Intel is an innovator. And so I think it's pretty exciting that Intel has said, well, we're a hardware company, but the best way for us to look after our channel partners is to go out there and say, you need some extra tools to help sell more of the hardware, rather than just keep plugging hardware, hardware, hardware. And I talk about it a lot in my column in CRN, about some vendors out there that really don't get the channels and they go out with mixed messages. One thing that I've always liked about Intel over the many years that I've dealt with Intel has been that they say loud and clear that we are a 
channel supporter. And they keep doing that. And I don't see, I hope I'm not talking about Twitter, but I don't see that changing for a long time. And, and I think it's great. So I think, Camille, what you're talking about is great that Intel are going out there trying to support the retailers in the community to really go out there with a strong channel message. Um, we've got Ms. Megabyte again with the microphone. So if you've got some questions, of course, I'll be around on the breaks and afterwards there's some networking available. So I'll be around there. You can come and grab some questions. But if you've got some questions that you'd like to ask now, have to take a few minutes of questions. Or not. <laughs> Gee, that must have been a good talk, isn't it? Because no questions left. Right, I'll, ask your question. I'll ask you a question and get started. Um, with your agreement, say a, a customer signs up for a year and say half a year in, it just turns out to be not quite right for them. How do you how do you work that out with them? Do you do, have you ever had to sort of part ways with a client, sack a client? Uh, no, we haven't got the baseball bat. <laughs> which goes around takes care of it for us. <laughs> no, part of that is just really making sure you've got a great understanding of what both parties are delivering in the first place. If you go down and explain what it is and you go through that process, we haven't had to do that. We've had to sack clients who didn't want to get onto an SLA, and that's important. Some clients have said to us, ah, oh, gee, we don't like this. We want to go on with great things, and, and we know it's not going to be a good relationship. we said to some clients, well, we think this is the best model for you. If we can't do that for you, we don't want to do it. But once people have jumped onto an SLA, then they've really said, this is what we want, this is what we need. So we haven't had that situation. Thanks, Ms. Megabyte. Right. All right. Good first question to start off. Uh, I want to know how you handle the situation. Say a new customer, they want to join the SLA, but all of the machines are from you, and you don't know the condition of the machine. How can you pick the price of this SLA? So that's a good question. So basically, if we go along and look at a new client, so this is a new client, we haven't done the work for them in the past. The first thing we'll do is a network analysis. Now I mentioned to say it before, one of the things that I do is I'll typically go in, get one of my techs to load that, that tool, and it gives us a lot of information back straight away so we can analyse that. And we'll often say to a client, we're not going to sign you up to an SLA until you spend X dollars to get your network up to a certain level. Now I had one great example of that where we went in, we had a look at the client's network, they were ready to sign the SLA, and our technicians came back and said, this is a terrible network, we need to spend some serious money. I went back to the client and said, you're going to need to spend $22,000 to upgrade this and this and this before we'll need to support you. And he said, thank you. He said, I've been struggling so hard with my network, not working, I've been talking to my current IT guy saying, do I need to fix it up? And he kept getting fobbed off by this guy. He thanked me for spending his money. He spent the 22 grand and then signed up for an SLA and on the went and he's still an SLA client today. So you really need to do an analysis of their network before you start. Thank you. Any other questions there? Can, can I just offer you one too? Sure. I guess one of the most difficult things that most um, channel accounts would feel is taking that first step. I mean, we're kind of selling a lot of boxes and trying traditional channel business. What are some of your suggestions of the first step? What are the first things that you see they could do to move on to NSV, or even consider how they can do that? One of the things I think is important is, is you don't want to be half pregnant. There's no value in saying, I'll try it a little bit, and oh, it didn't really work. I tried one client, and that didn't really work. Steve Barmer, you, you've probably all heard Steve Barmer talk. One of the things he really talked about is making a big bet. If you believe in something, if you believe in the model, believe in the concept, make a big bet. You don't think about it for a while and get around to it. You say, let's go and do it. And, and one of those things there, go through the process, get things that you think are right, and then go and launch it to your client base. And you'll be absolutely amazed how hungry they are for it. You'll be amazed at how much they want it. So my answer to that Camille, would be, go through the process and get something that you can get out there, get some marketing started, start some, some presentations to your clients. Do some advertising around it. What you'll find is that people are so hungry for it, you'll have more people sign up than you can imagine. It's a bit like the insurance policy. The reason insurance companies survive is because they have lots of people who insure with them. If you had an insurance company that you were the only one that had your house insured with them, you'd be a little bit scared about what would happen if your house got broken into or it burnt down because you probably didn't think they'd have enough money to, to pay you what would happen there. And it's the same with SLA clients. You want lots of SLA clients. You want as many as possible to really spread that risk out in your overall business. So, Make a big bet in your business and, and really go forward strong. Thanks, Camille. Any more questions? Have How much do you charge per client or customer? Is it different for everyone or is it flat? Being no. Much? Is it and, and, and I, yeah, sorry, Tom. I know some people go out and say, we just charge $50 per machine. 
and, and we, we kind of do that, but we've got a spreadsheet that we've set up, which, as I said before, is about a five-minute quote, and all that people do is they punch in how many servers, how many terminal servers, how many workstations, how many notebooks. There's about eight variables they punch in, and that just gives them a total amount. Because ultimately, the client doesn't care if you charge them $50 a machine and $100 a server, or $70 a machine and $50 a server. They want to know how much they're going to pay. So we do it like that because we've built a few variables into that spreadsheet that then punches out a number at the end of it all. Plus, we've got the four levels. So we can say it'll be $10,000 for a client at a platinum level for a 5 PC network, for example, and they can go back through the different levels. So it's not just a simple charge 50 bucks a machine and away you go. I think there's more variables in it than that. And, and there are some models that do say just charging out for the machine. I'm not saying they're wrong, it's just a little bit different in the way we do it. As we see the marketplace moving more towards the cloud, we're seeing platform as a service, software as a service. How do you see you transitioning your business model to the future where things are going to be in the cloud? Mm. And ultimately, one of the things I, I think that's pretty exciting about having things like software as a service is that you still need something at the end user and you still need someone that understands it. So I really see this complementing any of the services that might be delivered in the cloud, whether it be hosted exchange, whether it be software as a service in terms of applications, you still need a device. You don't just walk in and sit at your desk and start typing at your desk. You need a device there. And you also, I mean, you've all done it with a client, they've said, oh, we want to set up email services through some top tree provider. I don't know how to do that. Can you come and do it for me? So they still need to configure that and maintain that, whether it's on their premises or somewhere else out there in the cloud, it still needs to be maintained. If you can get your client base used to the idea of paying per staff member effectively, this is you know, effectively what you're doing. When you say amount per machine, you're paying an amount per staff member, they don't want to lose that comfort. They, if it's working out there, it's even more complicated, where it's not a server in your environment, they see that it's probably even more complicated. I really need someone that can understand what we're doing with it. In fact, one of the, the, the things that we saw once we, this is going for a few years now, we actually had Intel come along and help us out in a presentation we did to our clients. And we had an Intel staff member come along and, and we did a presentation. And the Intel staff member did a good job and our technicians sat around and looked at the presentation, it was great. And one of the, the clients that we had come along to encourage me after and said, you know what I got out of that presentation? I said, no, I thought he was going to have some profound thing that he got out of it. He said, I got out of it today, I know nothing about IT, I've got to keep employing you guys to solve my problems for me. And so in some ways, the, the Intel guy probably aimed a bit high, but that was good because what it meant was these guys knew that they needed an expert to come along and actually take care of things for us. So I think it's only going to keep going forward with that and it's going to complement those services. If you want to go along and recommend those services to a client in your consulting business, have you heard about this? Explain it to them. That answer your question? <laughs> Talk to me afterwards. <laughs> um, my question is, um, let's say that, for example, someone's paid annually, so they've got their discount and everything, and it was $10,000 for the year, and then they, their business increases, and then 10 more staff come on, and 10 more computers. How do you deal with that? Yeah, it's, it's a pretty simple process. Each time one of our staff does a maintenance check, they do a quick check on the numbers. And we lay that quite clearly in the contract. If the numbers change during the year, then we'll adjust their contract accordingly. So it's a simple mention from the maintenance technician that, oh, you've got more numbers. Oh, yeah, that's right. We added a PC. Normally we do them on daily, so we know about it anyway. But if we don't, oh, you've added a PC, we'll adjust that contract for you. And then we just pro rata that for the rest of the year. A little bit of admin, but it doesn't happen that dramatically. But it's extra income you're picking up. So you don't mind doing the invoice for a bit of extra income for the year. Yeah, a good question, though. Have you ever been asked about uh, the VoIP and can you manage as well my photocopier, my multi-processor, uh, multi-function machine and so on, and how do you deal with it? Yeah, it's, it's again something that you've got to be pretty clear in what you do. Stick to the knitting, is the old saying. Stick to what you do and do well. If you're a company that provides VoIP services, that provides photocopier services, sure, build those into your SLA. If you're someone who doesn't want to touch those and recommend them to someone else, then make it very clear what your SLA is. And one of the great things about the SLA is you've got a contract that says, here's what we'll do for you, and here are the services we will cover. And if it's outside those, sometimes a client might ask me about, should they buy, in the consulting business, should they buy an LCD TV or a plasma TV? I usually say, I don't know, but I'll go and research it for you. Or I'll, I'll put you in touch with Billy Boggs, and he's the expert on that, and he'll come back to you. So it really comes down to what your business does. If your business covers those, Make sure you build them into the SLA. Make sure you build those services in that you can have as items that you add on. If you don't touch them, then give them good advice about that. But, but don't try and do things outside your core competency. Thanks. Last question.
Have you given under pressure? Uh, so, well, what's the average size of some of these clients that you're providing the managed services for? Yeah, as you talk about the presentation, we've got over 100 sites and we've got over 1,100 PCs on that system. So our average clients are about 11 PCs a site. But that's because Dubbo, as a city, has only 50 businesses that employ more than 50 people. And some of those, like the local abattoir, employs a few hundred people. So they've only got about five PCs. So most of those places employ more than 50 are very labour intensive and don't have any PCs. So that's a, just the size of our environment, the nature of our market. You will still keep the average size business that you've got now in whatever business everyone has got in terms of the average size of their clients, you'll probably still keep that same average unless you go and try and attack a different part of the market. But you'll probably keep that same average. Um, it really depends upon what your business model is and how you drive that forward. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. That was great. Hopefully you got something out of that. And again, I'll be here for the rest of the afternoon and evening. So come and grab me and certainly talk to me about more questions. And you've, you've got the book at the back you'll pick up as you go out. My email address is in there as well, so feel free to email me all your questions and I might have answered some of them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. Wow, you can slow him down. <laughs> I didn't